Next, we're going to have uh, Mamik, the hominis robot. Uh, Michael's going to speak, and then we'll take a few questions. Thank you. Good morning, everyone. Thank you very much for this opportunity, Dr. Patel and moderators. Uh, I am excited and proud to present to you today the technology we've developed at Mimic Innovative Surgery, which we believe is ushering in a new era in soft tissue robotics. As Dr. Satava said just this morning, it's impossible to speak about soft tissue robotics without talking about the revolution of minimally invasive surgery. Uh, it was 1987, the year I graduated high school actually, that the first video lap coli was performed. And mind-blowingly, it was just 10 years later that the first robotic coli was done uh, with technology that you're all quite familiar with. Now, this transformation from one large incision to multiple small incisions was an absolute um, uh, revelation. It was an advancement in particular for the patients because of the reduction in the invasiveness of the procedure. So instead of the surgeon's hands inside the abdomen, motion is transmitted outside the body to inside the body through this fulcrum that was the port um, through the abdomen at each instrument, uh, which consisted of a straight stick with tools on the end was entered. Now, the quality of the triangulation, which is how the tools uh, work on the anatomy, is completely defined by where these ports are placed. Now, current robotic solutions, in general, have done a great job at mechanizing these straight stick laparoscopic tools. They've essentially put a robot uh, to drive each one of these sticks, which undoubtedly has improved the precision and accuracy with how these tools can be manipulated. But current robotic techniques are all based on the principles of laparoscopic procedures. Many of these, as you see in the picture, are large systems that can take up significant space in the OR, and they can often be quite expensive. Now, because it's based on the principles of laparoscopic surgery, it inherits some of the potential or persistent issues that can occur uh, with laparoscopic techniques. Um, for instance, uh, it's definitely less invasive than an open procedure, but it's not the least invasive. This is a picture of a woman's abdomen uh, after a, a, a laparoscopic hysterectomy with four uh, incisions. So we can be less invasive than that. This fulcrum effect I talked about, it's important to drive the motion outside the body, inside the body, so that motion at the point of entry into the abdomen is absolutely minimized to minimize the uh, soft tissue trauma and potentially pneumo issues that can occur. Uh, triangulation can be an issue. This is a picture from a single port laparoscopic technique where you can see the tools are actually parallel. This is not optimal, uh, not an optimal working angle to work on the tissues. And then because you're entering straight sticks through single ports in the abdomen, you are by definition limited in what you can reach inside the abdomen. Well, we feel like our technology has solved all these problems. And the way we've done that is we've gone from uh, straight instruments through multiple ports to multiple flexible instruments through a single port. And the picture you see on the left is our current offering, FDA approved, doing cases today. You can see some in some of the talks at this conference. Uh, there are two flexible arms. There's a, uh, it mimics the motion of the, of the human arm with a shoulder and an elbow and a wrist joint. You can see our next gen platform that we're working on has the ability to add additional instruments, including uh, an articulated 3D HD camera. So how are we able to do this? Well, the first ingredient in the secret sauce is really the nested articulated tubes. Uh, as you see here, our wrist tube is nested inside uh, the elbow tube, which is nested inside the shoulder tube, and you can see how the linkages are made. Uh, the second ingredient in the secret sauce is the way we create motion. So if I wanted to make a straight instrument uh, flexible, uh, the most intuitive thing to do is to pick a point on the link, add a joint, and then bend around that joint. It's how my elbow works, it's how a door hinge works. Well, we've taken a completely different approach uh, to the way uh, motion occurs on this. Instead of taking a point on the link, we actually uh, flex about a length of the link. And what that does is instead of the center of rotation on the link, it's far off of the link. And that allows you to bend not just to 180 degrees, but beyond that, beyond the horizon, bend down, uh, uh, so that when you're at these angles, you have your other rotational degrees of freedom that allow you to work in ways that no instruments currently can do. And so what that's done is, in general in robotics, you have to trade off 
Uh, you have to sacrifice strength for flexibility, usually. There are flexible robots in medicine, but they are usually for low payload applications, such as driving uh, a camera endoluminally or uh, um, a needle biopsy. So what we've done with the way these, uh, the design of these tubes and the way they work is we're able to maintain both the grip strength and payload strength while also maintaining this unprecedented flexibility. So here's a video of our co-founder and CEO uh, with one of the first prototypes. You can see it mimicking his, his arm motion. The idea was to take this, miniaturize it, and have all of this articulation happen inside the abdomen. Here's a video of the uh, instruments as they are today. Uh, we, of course, have a sheath on these instruments uh, during the procedures, but this helps you see the nested articulation. You can see the shoulder tube, the elbow tube. You can see uh, the incredible range of motion that these have. This shows the cable driving these linkages. Again, this is really uh, the secret sauce to how we create the reach and articulation of these tools. Uh, so the system is made up of a robot, which is 12 or 13 pounds. You can carry it under your arm. You can walk it from room to room. It's so small, we actually mount it to the bed. This has a significant clinical advantage. Uh, if you want to change uh, the angle of the bed during a procedure, for instance, with a high BMI patient or something like that, you don't have to undock the robot to do that. You can leave the robot in place, leave the arms inside the patient, and it all moves with the table. Uh, we have an open surgeon console. The surgeon sits there, manipulates the arms with these controllers, and as you can see, it's open, so we have complete visual and communication access to the rest of the operating room. Uh, here's just some images of the size of our system in relation to the legacy system. You can see it's designed to fit in any size operating room, even ambulatory surgery centers. It's highly mobile. It's a fraction of the cost of, of current systems, and it really allows the surgeon easy patient access. So what does this allow us to do? It allows us to be less invasive, and we can even go through a natural orifice. Our first indication is a transvaginal hysterectomy and adnexal procedures. We have a few talks at this conference on that, which you can see. Uh, this video shows entry of the arms through the rectouterine pouch below the cervix. Once the arms are inside the abdomen, they retroflex back towards the point of entry, and then they perform the procedure from fundus to cervix as you normally would. So we're not changing the workflow at all. We're just changing the way you enter and decreasing the invasiveness. Why do we want to go through uh, a vaginal or a natural orifice approach? Well, this is the current state of approaches to gynecologic procedures from the most invasive on the left to the least invasive on the right. Uh, and the clinical benefits of a vaginal approach to a hysterectomy are so well documented that society organizations, um, payers like United Healthcare, they've come out with statements saying that the vaginal hysterectomy approach is the approach of choice whenever feasible because it has better clinical outcomes. But as you can see in the bar graph, it's only used 16% of the time, which begs the question, why? Well, there's several reasons. One of them is it's a difficult procedure. Visualization can be challenging. But there are certain anatomic aspects of the disease state which make it prohibitively challenging to do a vaginal approach, even if a surgeon is well-trained and wants to do that technique, and they include the prolapse level, which is where the uterus is lying in the vaginal canal, the size of the uterus, uh, the presence and location of adhesions. Well, the way we've designed our tools, the reach and articulation, uh, makes our approach, uh, we don't have any of these limitations. So we feel like our technology enables more surgeons to offer more women the pre clinically preferred approach to their hysterectomy. Uh, I'll show a short video here with some sound. This is Professor Jan Bacalan. He performed about half of the cases that we submitted to the FDA for our uh, de novo approval, and he'll discuss his uh, clinical experience. My experience with the Hominis system exists in patients that I operated for both clinical trials that were conducted to get the de novo FDA approval. I had at the time experience with the currently available robotic systems that function very well, but don't actually reduce the invasiveness of the surgery for the patient when compared to standard laparoscopy. But you can see from the results that were recently published in the Journal of Minimally Invasive Gynecology that we operated a good variability of patients with low and high BMIs, small and larger uteri, patients with and without prolapse. 80% of the patients had comorbidities, and many patients had previous surgery and adhesions. 
All the procedures in both trials were completed without conversion, within very reasonable operating times and without complications. And there was good vaginal cuff healing in all patients. Every new system has a learning curve, and so does the hominis robot. But during the clinical trials, we noticed that the learning curve was sh short, both for the OR staff and for the surgeon. The system has a very small footprint so that it can easily be moved from one OR to the next between procedures, and the nursing staff can do the setup quickly. One of my fellows operated four cases. She had no previous robotic experience at all, and she quickly learned to work with the system and completed four hysterectomies easily. I think what really helps beginning surgeons who don't have a lot of vaginal surgery experience is the retroflexion of the system. You can operate transvaginally, but the retroflexion of the robotic arms make it seem as if you're operating transabdominally, as you used to in, in laparoscopy. So the issues that we talked about with current uh, approaches, uh, which also exist with some laparoscopic techniques, we feel like we've solved those. We are definitely less invasive. Uh, we don't have a fulcrum effect because all of, all of the articulation occurs inside the abdomen. Triangulation, again, because of the articulation is not an issue. And the system is designed with a single vaginal entry point uh, to reach every spot in the abdomen, all four quadrants, all the way up to the periaortic nodes. So what does this paradigm shift in robotics allow us to do? Well, we've been in the lab working on the feasibility of our device for other procedures beyond gynecology. Uh, we've done a study. Many of these are uh, presented here at this meeting. Uh, this is an inguinal hernia repair through a single trans fan and steel abdominal approach. You can see the arms retroflexed all the way below the horizon working on the triangle of doom, which is important in uh, hernia repair. We've done a transvaginal cholecystectomy. Instead of retroflex, the arms are working forward. These are all cadaveric experiments where we're proving the feasibility. Uh, we've excised a uh, uh, transanally or rectal lesion, again working forward all the way up to the rectosidmoid junction. If, if you know your anal anatomy, this is a, a, a fairly important landmark to reach and work with these tools. And finally, what, what I feel is probably the most clinically important is we've done a colectomy uh, with a single abdominal approach through this trans fan and steel incision. And you can see the articulation of the arms. There's no robot or other tools out there that can uh, articulate like you see here in this picture. And the reason I think it might be uh, the most clinically beneficial, and clinical studies hopefully will prove this out, is this procedure, if you do this laparoscopically, requires five or six uh, ports in the abdomen, and we're able to do this with a single incision. So. Um, as Dr. Ross said yesterday in our session, the future of soft tissue robotics includes flexible robots through single ports. So if you're interested in what that looks like, please come by the Mimic booth. Thank you. Well, uh, thank you. I, I think what we'll do is uh, we'll try and take a couple of questions. Uh, maybe you can share with us. You, you do have kind of an interesting event this evening, I believe. We do, please. Uh, tonight there's something called Project M, we're trying to, uh, you know, this is an academic conference. There's a lot of good science here, but we're trying to be light and have some fun. We have an event at 6 o'clock uh, right around the corner in one of the big ballrooms. Please come. There'll be drinks, and we'll, we'll have a, a special announcement, actually. Thank you for that. Yeah, I think you guys should try and be there for that. It's a very interesting announcement. Uh, Sharona, Marty, a couple of questions for, for our panel. Um, while you're there, um, this system is for single incision, but right now it's not single incision yet because the scope is coming somewhere in another incision. Correct. So uh, as one of the previous speaker uh, said, we understand our core competencies are robotic technology, uh, so we are not... Uh, releasing this first application with our own vision system. So we are scope agnostic. You can use whatever system you currently use. And so, yes, the arms, the two arms that do the work are through a single incision, and we do have one um, incision uh, through the umbilicus for a camera at this point. You are correct. What's the size of the two arms that, that, pour, that uh, provides you the arms? What size incision do you have to make? It's, it's two and a half centimeters uh, for the cannula um, on the long axis. Uh, we have a new cannula. We, as you can see with those arms, there is some space to move those closer together, and we are certainly uh, working on that. Uh, do you have any um, 
image guidance uh, on the, that scope or future f to look for Sentinel nodes or ICG? Yes, that's definitely, uh, I did talk about how we want to expand to other indications, but the, th the, th the thing we're doing for our current gynecology customers uh, is to really add the ability to do Sentinel lymph node biopsies. And so we, as others have said, are looking for partners on the imaging side. Um, it's really, uh, that's really the way to advance technology. Uh, no one can do it, well, there's one company that I guess can do everything themselves, but the rest of us cannot. And so uh, we are looking for partners for some of these adjunctive technologies that will help advance. Thank you. Out of curiosity, just one second, why, why GYN where you're limited to 50% of the population rather than? Why not? Oh, why not? Increase to 100%? Good question. Do you guys want to, I'll, 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 I'll take a step. So. We, you know, the articulation that we have really allowed us um, to look for a procedure that had the potential for a large clinical benefit. Um, you know, our founder was, was going around talking to a, a lot of different surgeons, and it seemed, he talked to a gynecologist who said that statement that the vaginal approach is definitely the approach of choice. And so um, we just assumed that it was used all the time. And when we dug into it a little bit, it's not used very often. And it's because of these limitations. And it seemed like our technology was, was just right to help solve some of those.